So Judge, thank you for joining us uh, and sharing some time with us to talk about the situation before you and what's happened behind you as well. There, there are a lot of issues at play here, and I'll begin with, in, in, in a Facebook post, I've obviously tried to pay attention as best I can, you called what happened a travesty of justice, and, and really kind of malign, uh, my word, malign some of the, the power brokers, if you will, in Hamilton County. How do you see what's happened to you to get you to this point? Okay, well, thank you, and, and I wouldn't call it maligned. Um, I would say that I was um, being very forthright and honest with how I have been treated, um, not just in the past five years, but Todd, it's really important that people understand that what has happened to me has taken place almost over 10 years now. Um, in a few months, it'll be 10 years, uh, January 2010, since this saga began for me. And it really started um, because I ran for judge of the Hamilton County Juvenile Court and as you know, that is a position that has never in the history of Hamilton County been held by an African American or a Democrat. And so I literally, um, when I was elected, I broke through the glass ceiling. But as you know, um, the election wasn't normal. It was very abnormal. And so also for the first time in history, I had to sue as an individual to even prove that I won the election. And there was so much animosity and hostility that was directed at me by certain individuals like the prosecutor of Hamilton County who was representing the um, Hamilton County Board of Elections against me and then later um, accused me of charges after I was sworn in that um, you have to look at the entire picture. You have to view the, um, the history of the case, you know, starting with the um, Hunter v. Hamilton County Board of Elections and then finally culminating in these false criminal charges that were filed against me in 2014. And here we are in 2019 and it's still going on. And I think it's, that's a really important point to make because I think even in my reporting, it's been just what's been happening in the last X number of months or what's been happening over the course of the couple of years where you've been wondering, we've been wondering, when's it gonna come out of Judge Black's courtroom or whatnot. So to your mind, it all goes back, the, the challenges that you pose to the system and the difficulty just in certifying that election. So that's interesting. Um, you, what were you, once you got into that, I was, I was made a note, once you got into your judgeship, you, you know, you have said you were sort of exposing things that, that correcting wrongs that you perceived. Absolutely. What were some of the things that, that you did and that you felt were worthwhile and then were you getting pushback all along the way from others? Oh, it was hostile. Again, um, you have to understand that the prosecutor who was representing the Hamilton County Board of Election, they appealed my case at least six times. It was appealed um, to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. It was appealed to all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. Um, and so there was pushback all the way. And so when they were forced to count those votes, those provisional ballots that they had refused to count, even defying the federal court order repeatedly before they counted those votes, they were, they were mad about it. And so when I came in and was finally sworn in over 18 months late um, in May of 2012, um, they were hostile. I mean, the prosecutors were hostile when, when I walked in the door. And so there was nothing normal even about my daily work. Uh, my staff had a joke. What are they going to do to Judge Hunter today? Every day we faced some type of, um, of pushback in the court. And eventually I started being charged uh, or, or, or lawsuits were filed against me. And then the prosecutor, the same prosecutor who was representing me or representing the county in the Board of Election lawsuit, which by the way was still ongoing at the time, he then began representing me in those same cases and, and civil suits that were filed against me. And that's an, that's an ethical violation. That's literally prohibited by the Code of Professional Conduct to have a person that is involved in a lawsuit against you then to represent you. And so these are the type of challenges that I was facing every single day as a judge on the bench for the first time, uh, literally working very hard. I worked until 11, 12 midnight almost every night because I had the highest caseload in the state of Ohio. I had over 14,000 cases that were under my jurisdiction. Um, I was giving great attention to them. And then in the middle of that, I started discovering that there were problems with the juvenile court. Um, and I, if you do a public records request on Judge Hunter's emails, you will find that the things that I'm alleging were not, they're not just my perception, they were my reality. Uh, for instance, within three months, I discovered that the statistical uh, reporting system of the juvenile court um, was the information that they were submitting to the Ohio Supreme Court was, was wrong. And as a judge, I had to sign off on these documents every single month. 
And as I began to look at the reports and see that they were not lining up, the, the numbers weren't matching, I began to ask questions. And so I sent uh, emails to Connie Murdoch, who was the um, super, the director of case management. I sent uh, emails to the uh, clerk's office and I requested uh, to know why the documentation that they were giving to me to sign off on as a judge was inaccurate. Initially, they denied it. But several emails later, Connie admitted that, you're right, Judge, these are wrong. The Ohio Supreme Court was forced to come into the juvenile court and started, they put a team, a team of people in place to go through the case management system, JCMS, of the juvenile court, and they had to change the reporting system because, in fact, they determined that all of the statistical data that was being submitted from the juvenile court to the Ohio Supreme Court was, in fact, wrong. And that mattered because cases weren't being Ooh. tracked properly and the state might have felt, well, they don't have as many situations as the reality would, would show. Is that fair to think? It, it's, Help me understand. That's a problem, obviously. It's a, it's a great problem because those statistics identify the type of case um, by, for instance, we have child support cases, we have delinquency cases, we have abuse, dependency, and neglect cases. And the, the reporting system identifies how many of those cases are in the system or on the docket at any given time. And so collectively, um, the, there's a reason that the Ohio Supreme Court requires all of the courts across the state of Ohio to report accurate data so that they, in fact, know how many cases are, are, are before a court, how many are being disposed, how are those cases being disposed. And in our cases, they were reporting, uh, again, the numbers were just, they were incorrect. The cases were totally improperly identified. And it was a big enough deal that the director of the case management of the state of Ohio, uh, Ohio Supreme Court, had to come in and direct the process herself. And if you would go through my, again, my emails uh, going back and forth, uh, my emails to the Ohio Supreme Court as well as to uh, the juvenile court, you would find that not only was it critical data that was being misrepresented, it was so critical that the Ohio Supreme Court came in and entirely uh, revamped the uh, juvenile court management system at juvenile court. And just, you know, as we talk about this, obviously some of what we talked about may not make it into the piece tonight sure. just because of the timing issues, but I'm, I always appreciate gaining insight, bottom line, so it can drive for stories going forward, and it will all be part of it. It'll be in, you know, whether you know, I'm able to use it tonight or however it gets processed, it doesn't go out of my head, so that's important. The idea then, you know, I think it's in the, let's, uh, I'll use my word, the bluster of whether it's talk radio or external voices and everything, a lot of what the public has heard is that, you know, Judge Hunter dragged her feet, uh, delayed cases in some instances, and the public doesn't know any different until they hear from you in this in this way as best we can. Um, did, were you aware of this? Uh, those critics just kind of taking the public platform and kind of saying, trying to, you know, step on you a little bit and say, well, she's just not being a good judge and she wants to paint the walls and she's not worried about the kids or wh whatever the critics might have said. How did you process all that? Well, first of all, again, what you're referring to or referencing was um, started by the persons who opposed me being the juvenile court judge. And so you had a lot of these accusations that were being falsely made by the prosecutor's office, to be quite honestly, and some of the persons that were working uh, with them. Um, not only was this racial in, in so many respects, because again, I'm the only judge in the history of Hamilton County or even the state of Ohio um, that I'm aware that has ever been treated this way, where persons from the outside were, un were trying to come in and to manage a, a judge's document, uh, a docket. And, and just to put it in perspective, Todd, you know that we've been waiting three years for a federal court ruling in my case. And so I had 14,000 cases and these cases are important because I think they're probably, the juvenile court cases are probably some of the most important cases that could ever appear before a judge. Because in most instances, I'm making as a juvenile court judge determinations as to whether or not a child will be permanently removed from their home and disconnected from their family forever. That's not something that you take lightly and it's something that you have to give as a judge if you care about the children and their families, you must give the utmost of consideration. That means that when I came in, quite honestly, for an abuse dependency and a neglect case, it takes approximately two years before that case ever comes before a judge. And so part of the, the misnomer and the, um, the, the misinformation that the public was receiving 
is that first of all, that case was in juvenile court for years, typically before it ever appeared before Judge Hunter's docket. And by the time it got to me, I was tasked with the responsibility of reviewing years of transcripts. A case could have been, and, and it's really sad because even some of the judges that later are tempted to weigh in on this, the truth of the matter is I had some of their cases that were still lingering over from juvenile court even after they left. And so there were cases that I was reviewing uh, to make a, 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 a determination of permanent custody that had been in, a, in the court two years, five years, 10 years, um, et cetera. The other thing that people don't understand is that the juvenile court cases are vastly different from any other kind of cases. And according to the Ohio Supreme Court, they had specified um, recommended guidelines, not anything set in stone, but they were recommended guidelines that depended on the type of case. So you might have a case like a delinquency or something, and depending on what type of case it was, there might be um, 120 days, there might be six months. In some instances, it was over a year. It depended on the type of case that it was. But when I was tasked with the responsibility of reviewing a case, and, and I'm not a rubber stamp kind of judge, and most of the cases were initially heard by magistrates uh, before they ever arrived on my desk. So by the time they arrived on my desk, I had to review that case thoroughly to determine whether or not that magistrate had made the right decision because that child's life depended upon it, that family's future depended upon it, and I believe that I gave the type of judicious um, review of cases that was required. And I hate to say, but there were a number of times or I needed to, I had to overturn those magistrates. And so I couldn't do that lightly. You know, I, I slept on my cases. I, I took transcripts to bed with me. It was so important to me that I ruled rightly in a case and because their, their future was ultimately going to depend on whatever determination that I made. And then to be honest, in terms of the other accusation, John Williams eventually, I think at the request of the prosecutor, um, and whomever he was working with began to make those type of accusations. But when my lawyer, Jennifer Branch, actually did a public records request to the Ohio Supreme Court on um, our, the, the disposition time, actually John Williams, uh, who actually reported it, the Supreme Court documents show he actually had more cases that were out of time, if you will, or that, uh, that, that were tardy. Uh, it was not me, and this came out even in the uh, trial later that we had documents from the Ohio Supreme Court that stated just the opposite of what your critics that you're referring to uh, were stating. A lot to unpack in all that. Um, I'm struck, Judge Hunter, we're, we're in this church, and, and mm -hmm. I had some questions, I'll just ask you this one, I'll take it slightly to her. Your faith clearly drives you, and I would imagine everything you do. Um, how important has your faith been? I know you've, you've publicly talked about it, and that's what you do as a, as a pastor. Absolutely. In this situation and with the prospect and the very, it sounds like the real likelihood, it seems like, you know, whether you're resigned to it or not, I don't know. You tell me, but jail looks likely, in my mind. I, what do I know? It could change. But how important has your faith been in all this, on this journey? Oh, my faith has been important, I mean, from day one. I only ran... Uh, for judge of Helena County Juvenile Court because I believe that that's what God led me to do. I don't make decisions lightly. You know, I broke my back in a car accident in uh, 1987, my last year of college, and I was initially paralyzed. I couldn't walk. I had broken uh, almost every major part of my body. I was, um, I had surgery. I had metal rods placed. I was in a body cast. I had a leg cast, arm cast. I had head surgery, you know, just and honestly, at that time in my life, I made a determination that everything I did in life, because God gave me not only a second chance, but he allowed me to walk again, I determined that I would always serve him. I would always put him first. And so my decision to become a lawyer, that had everything to do with my faith and me believing that that's how God wanted me to make a difference. Um, ultimately, when I ran for juvenile court judge, and that was even after I became the pastor of this church, um, it was because I believed that God was leading me that way because as a lawyer, I saw so many problems within the juvenile court when I represented young people, and I knew that something needed to change. Something needed to uh, happen to, um, to instill justice and equality and to make sure that these young people were rehabilitate, rehabilitated and that they would have a chance at life. And so my faith has been very, very uh, critical, and especially over the last few years, being falsely accused of crimes and you know having a, a trial that was, quite honestly, I believe made a mockery of the system. It was so unfair. Um, 
it's only been my faith in God that has helped me to stand and to be honest, not to lose hope in humanity as a whole. Because when you have persons that, first of all, are falsely accusing you um, and again, making a mockery of the system that I swore both as a lawyer and a judge to uphold, it has caused me to lose confidence in the system itself. But it's my faith in God that has kept me rooted and grounded and hopeful that sooner or later, people of, of right mind, people who are moral, people who are just, will come to the right conclusion and do the right thing by me. You know, and you saying that you have faith in your, in, in God. Most of all. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The idea that you're losing faith in the system, and yet for such a long period you were part of it, but I get your point that it's uh, sort of a biblically based and driven to be that, uh, to be a part of it. But, but what, 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 what do you say to people in the community that would think, well, if she's lost faith in it because she was a part of it, what should we think? If anything, Todd, I believe it's a call to action. I think even what I have personally experienced as a judge, I mean, you're looking at a judge that had judicial immunity, and, but it was stripped from me. You're looking at a, 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 a judge that was um, mocked um, as I entered the courtroom you know, each day. Um, they said the, the most horrendous things um, about me. And you know the, the code of judicial conduct, the code of professional conduct, it precludes and uh, it, it prohibits um, a lot of the things um, that I experience. And it's, it's disappointing to me because I was accused of being an advocate for the children. I mean, think about it. I'm a judge charged with rehabilitating children Yet I'm literally accused in documents of being an advocate for the children. In other words, by my um, treating the children fairly, by my making sure that the constitutional rights of the children are upheld every day, by my ensuring that children are not filmed in the media because they're children and that could destroy their future um, if they are, you know, if we successfully rehabilitate them and then their names are plastered all over the media, that follows those young people forever. So all of the things that I was doing right as a juvenile court judge, I was criticized and attacked for. And so I hope that people will examine their consciousness. And if, if you have children, imagine if your children, Todd, came into contact with the juvenile court. How would you want your children treated? Would you want their constitutional rights to be upheld? Would you want them to be treated fairly? Would you want them to make sure that they had proper legal representation? Those are the types of things that I did, even down to changing the law. You know, you know that people were saying, oh, she's incompetent, oh, she's in over her head. How could I be in over my head if I changed law? In just the time that I was on the bench before the charges were brought against me, I changed Ohio law so that now exculpatory evidence, Brady material, police reports are now required to be turned over by the prosecutor's office to the defense lawyers or the children so that they can be properly represented at court. Why would we withhold critical information from children that could prove their, their innocence when we're trying to rehabilitate them and not incarcerate them? So let's come to the forward, or let's come to the present. <laughs> Obviously, you, you, I want to have you state how you view the conviction. You flat out don't believe that you've been convicted fairly. Is that fair? You don't believe that you committed a crime. I, no, I did not commit a crime. And let me help you here. This is what I was charged with. Having an unlawful, an unlawful interest in a public contract, it's Ohio Revised Code 2921.42. This is what it reads. No public official shall knowingly do any of the following, authorize or employ the authority or influence of the public official's office to secure authorization of any public contract in which the public official, a member of the public official's family, or any of the public official's business associations has an interest. You know what this, this actually covers? This actually covers what Supreme Ohio Court Supreme Justice Pat DeWye did when he asked Hamilton County Prosecutor Joe Dieters to give his son a job, and then Hamilton County Prosecutor Joe Dieters in an email sent, uh, or sent an email to a county employee and said, hire this one. And both of his children work for the county. That's what this statute is designed to cover. I didn't do any of this. And so the fact that I was allegedly convicted of something with no evidence because there is no evidence because I didn't break any laws here. And so that's also disheartening. But even more so, Todd, 
three jurors came forward immediately, not weeks later, they came forward that same day immediately after trial and they said that guilty was not their verdict and had they been polled as they should have been as the law requires, they would have said so. And so the fact that that so-called verdict was sealed, we never shown to the public on a, I believe it was a Labor Day weekend supposedly, it's supposedly sealed, jurors are released, they're not sequestered like they were in Ray Tenzing's trial, they're released out into the community. A few days later, the judge reads this so-called conviction on the record, and then I immediately ask for a polling of that jury to show that whatever that they allege is in fact their verdict, and he denies me my constitutional right to have that jury polled. That's questionable in and of itself, why? Why did he deny the, the, those jurors the right to be heard? And to this day, those jurors have been denied the right to be heard. Why didn't that judge come forward and say that those jurors had in fact contacted him? I believe even before we brought it out that the uh, three jurors had said guilty was not their verdict, those jurors first contacted that judge. And honestly, if I were that judge and there were that type of, of question, uh, you know, questionability, uh, at play for something so critical as determining the, the guilt or innocence or even the freedom or lack thereof of a defendant, I would personally err on the side of doing what's right and doing what's constitutional. And so absolutely, um, I question uh, this, this conviction. The, I, the, I know, uh, Mr. Singleton, your, your team has filed to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Do you what, what do you foresee? You're, you, know, you, you know the law better than virtually anybody. Do you anticipate actually going to the Hamilton County Jail, or what, what are your thoughts right now? Because I know the law, I honestly can't say what someone else would do. I just know the difference between right and wrong. I know what's constitutional and unconstitutional. And because it's pretty clear, if you would review even the transcripts of what happened in my case, there were so many jurors that were literally connected to the prosecutor's office. They were friends of the, of the, of the prosecutors. They identified themselves as such. I, I hate to say it, we had an employee of, of, of Channel 9, WCPO, that was on my jury. And, and at the time that I was indicted and charged, Channel 9, we were in an active lawsuit. They were literally suing me civilly um, for um, uh, prohibiting them from publishing the names and the faces of the children. How does an employee of the media outlet that is suing you, and by the way, has probably published some of the most horrific stories out there about me without ever talking to me personally, yet they end up on my jury. There were just too many questionable things. And I was even accused of, of hugging a juror that I'd never seen before in my life. And it so happened that she was the next African-American juror that was uh, uh, on in line to be a juror during the voir dire process. And of course, after um, it was a Hamilton County employee that worked for the Treasurer's Department. How do all of these people, you had a Hamilton County employee work for the Treasurer's Department, there was somebody who worked from the Sheriff's Department in the jury, in the jury pool. How, you know, I've been a lawyer too long, it's going on 30 years. I've never in my entire legal career seen the type of what somebody might call coincidences that I don't believe were coincidences at all. I believe it was jury tampering to ensure that they could get this judge that, that they didn't want to be on the bench to find a way to manipulate information and to ensure in their minds that they got some kind of conviction even if it was, if there was no evidence and even though three jurors said guilty was not their verdict. After the, after the verdict, uh, yeah. Well, right after, because they were, they were dismissed. As soon as he denied me that poll, poll, he then immediately dismissed that jury, and then they contacted my lawyer that night. Now, Judge Nadel has said there's no politics involved in this. Your thoughts? When you have a judge that is a donor to the prosecutor, that made the accusations against you, as in my case, everybody was connected. The special prosecutors had never been prosecutors before. They were criminal defense attorneys. And not only that, they were Joe Dieter's personal defense lawyers, his criminal defense lawyers and his divorce lawyers. All, and they had made donations to Joe Dieter's. So all of these people were connected. When I filed the um, 
the election lawsuit, the Ohio Republican Party became a party to the suit as, as well as John Williams. And so you had, and, and I think you already know this, that the majority, especially of common pleas judgeships in Hamilton County are held by Republicans. And so indeed, this was definitely political. I was the only, the only Democrat in that level of position that had received the type of, of hostility and pushback even before um, I was ever sworn in or seated. So absolutely, it was political and absolutely, it was racially motivated. Oh, that's a lot to unpack in all of that. And listen, you know, to hear you speak, I mean, it sounds like you, you know, you could go back in time and be right at that judgeship today, it seems. I mean, you clearly are, you know, you know, intently aware of the law. In my impression, you know, I, so I'm just really kind of, um, that's interesting to me. It's not like the, the skills haven't diminished, it seems. And I know you're still fighting on your own behalf. Are you encouraged or discouraged or what, what's your sense of the support you've received? Um, as the time continues to tick down toward this July 12th um, hearing with Judge Nickelocker, and what's your sense of that, of the kind of support? Good, enough, you wish more, what are your thoughts? I'm, I'm blessed by the number of persons who are familiar with me in this community. You've never talked to me before, and quite honestly, this is the first interview um, that I have given any uh, media outlet, uh, any TV station in probably 10 years, or or at least five. And so, um, and it's because of how I was treated in the media. It was because I was never provided the opportunity to tell the truth or to allow my story or my side uh, to be heard. And so it's understandable why there are people in the community that are confused because they really don't know. And I hope that this interview will help to clear some of that up. But I'm encouraged. I have an overwhelming amount of support. I have thousands of people, literally, that support me. Um, there's a petition right now that, at last check in, in the last week or so, um, has probably close to 1,300 um, signatures. So I've always had community support. Um, I still have community support. I'm very encouraged by the community outpouring of love and support. And I'm hopeful that when the truth really comes out about what really happened to me and how this was strategically and systematically orchestrated against me, that there will be people who believed the worst of me and they will change their minds. In fact, let's get back to the jury. When we started the voir dire process on the first day, there were at least five persons on that jury that said they thought that I was guilty when I showed up, literally. And many of them ended up on my jury. And so just because of the exposure of, of, of the bad press that I was getting, even though I never had an opportunity to respond to anything, number one, the code of judicial ethics prohibited me from um, speaking out. And then quite honestly, I was never really approached uh, with the truth um, um, from, from the media. People just wrote stories about me and fanned the flames of hostility you know, against me, like the hate mail that I received at the juvenile court. I mean, I received racist hate mail um, while I was serving the public. And I, to this day, I can't understand how those racist hate mails, uh, those racist emails even reached me as a juvenile court judge because one would think that it would have been filtered. The other thing that I think is important, um, Todd, for you to understand and to know, um, and you can check all of this out, is that there are at least three or more Ohio Supreme Court cases in the state of Ohio. They're precedent cases because it, they were, um, the Ohio Supreme Court made the rulings that peer judges in one jurisdiction are prohibited, are prohibited from ruling over cases involving other peer judges. So I'm a common pleas judge in Hamilton County. Um, judge Norbert Nadel is a common pleas judge and now Patrick uh, Dinkelacker is a common pleas judge. We were all on the same level. We were peer judges in Hamilton County. According to the precedent set by the Ohio Supreme Court, they should never have been um, presiding over a case uh, of a peer judge. Give you an example. Um, I hate to use this as an example, but uh, even during this case, since uh, Patrick Dinkelacker took over, he was sued in a wrongful death lawsuit. He received a visiting judge. Um, Prosecutor Joe Dieters, he's not even a judge, but in his divorce matter, he was giving a visiting judge. So why is Judge Tracy Hunter the only judge in Hamilton County 
that has a case that's being presided over by peer judges, and not only peer judges, peer judges that are connected to the prosecutor's office, peer judges that are connected to the Republican Party, and peer judges that had an interest in me not being on the bench. I mean, arguably, you would think that Judge Nickelocker should not be the one at this hearing on July 12th. I mean, it should be a, a visiting judge, someone else that would review the case and make a determination. If they were to follow the law that was already established by the Ohio Supreme Court, give you another example, um, even if you wanted to, to, to go a different route, there's also ethics, uh, ethical uh, rules and canons that state that if a judge is in any ways involved with a, a, a ruling or a case in a lower matter, he is not to then uh, be involved in that case on any level. While serving as a juvenile court judge, when my cases were appealed uh, by whether it was the defense lawyers or prosecutors to the First District Court of Appeals, when they were appealed to that court, Patrick Dinkelacker was a First District Court of Appeals judge at the time. Many of the rulings that I made as a juvenile court judge were appealed to the First District Court of Appeals while he was on that court. He ruled against me in some of those cases, and then those cases were then used against me at the first trial that Norbert Nadel presided over. And then when we went forward and they were going to try me a second time, these same cases were being used as evidence. And so that was clearly prohibited by the code of ethics, that cases that he actually ruled on against me were then getting ready to be used at a criminal trial. There's conflict a, of interest. It's a conflict of interest and it's a clear bias coming in the, in the door. So what about the conversation you hear externally Judge Hunter was convicted by a multi, let's go back to the jury for a minute. Mm -hmm. Multiracial jury, you hear that a lot. And so the, the lay person hears, oh, well, obviously she's African American. Thank goodness it was a multiracial jur jury, so it had to be fair. The you don't buy that at all. Uh, well, no, the problem is that it was all the African American jurors that came forward and said that guilty was not their verdict, and in fact went further to say that they were being um, pressured by the jury forewoman who, by the way, is the wife of a lawyer that worked for the law firm that represented WCPO. And so not only then did you have a juror that was an employee of WCPO, you had a jury for a woman who was connected, who's, a, who's married to a lawyer. And then not only that, Todd, I'm not sure if you're aware, as soon as the trial ended, we received information that the jury for a woman did not like pastors because she had been molested by a pastor, her youth pastor. And when the question was asked during the voir dire process, does anyone here have a problem with pastors? She, she, she wasn't truthful. And then in fact, she lied on her jury questionnaire because the jury questionnaire specifically asked, um, has, have you as a, as a potential juror um, ever um, been involved in any, or been a victim of a crime? And she said no. And so, all of these things, um, this information was, was literally hidden from me, and I did not have the, the um, opportunity to even review, because the other thing that happened is I was denied a jury questionnaire. If you go back and look at Ray Tenzing's trial, he had over 100 question jury questionnaire. Mine was a standard. I had the most high profile case up until that point in the state, in, in Alameda County and in Ohio. I didn't even have the advantage of seeing a jury questionnaire. He got his, I believe, two weeks before the, the jury trial commenced. I saw my eight question jury questionnaire the day the voir dire process commenced at trial. That was the first time that I saw it. So I didn't have time or opportunity as most persons or as Ray Tenzing did to review the questionnaire, to see who these jurors were, to see who they were connected to, to see all of the political affiliation. Some of them were neighbors of judges. It was a mockery again of the entire system. And it's interesting you bring that up because I don't think that I have connected those dots uh, in my mind about Ray Tenzing and covering both of those trials and knee deep and all that. And here you were a judge being tried, you and know, and you relevant. would argue, well, I would like to think most logical thinking people would say a police officer, clearly very important, a judge, <laughs> clearly very important. Why would you not treat the two the same? That's pretty interesting. Absolutely. And, and this has also been overlooked and I'm not sure why at the commencement of uh, just before the second trial was scheduled to commence, we hired a forensic computer expert 
to go into the juvenile court and to look at computers, and that's when it was discovered that the other side had tampered with those computers. They had actually soiled the hard drives and prevented the evidence um, that I believe and know for a fact would have acquitted me. Charges should have never even been filed against me. Number one, not only because I had judicial immunity, but a lot of the, the everything that pretty much that they had accused me of, there were documents and records in black and white that would have proven that I did none of that. And those computers, we found out two years later at the commencement of the second trial, were destroyed by the juvenile court or the prosecutors. And those hard drives, not only were they soiled, um, they were also um, eliminated. I believe they said that the computers were sold and the hard drives were cleansed even before I was indicted in January of 2014. And in any criminal case involving computers, the first thing that should happen is that you preserve the evidence. And I assure you that we immediately requested that Norbert Nadel, that he would preserve the evidence in my case and he refused to do it. And the only way to me that you would refuse to preserve evidence in a critical case where you are literally accusing a sitting judge of a crime is that you know that that sitting judge is innocent, but you make the evidence that would exonerate me even before I'm charged, you make it disappear. And I'm just curious as to why, again, as a sitting judge, why not only am I scheduled to go to jail, but the persons who really tampered with evidence and really destroyed those computers to, I believe, frame me, have not even been charged with crime. Is there a possibility, in your mind, you tell me, you're a legal scholar, do you, it's almost like I would be asking you a question if you weren't in this situation. Tell me about Judge Hunter's case, and right. comment on it that way, on the, on the outside looking in. Even if you, you know, say you go to jail, spend X amount of months or maybe six months, I don't know, and, and uh, we'll see what the future holds. Is there a possibility on the back side that you would then there's an effort to either have all this overturned again, or are you gonna keep pressing on it? Because you make many salient points that obviously I would need to you know, explore further. I've been, I'm sure you've been screaming this from the mountaintop um, many, many times, and, and whether it's falling on deaf ears or you just are trying to get that across. Could that happen? I mean, are you gonna stop fighting this? Oh, absolutely not. First of all, as a pastor, my integrity and my character means everything to me. And prior to running for the judge of the Helens County Juvenile Court, um, prior to, um, I guess, uh, making upset the people who were accustomed to running the court, like the prosecutor's office and the Republican Party, prior to that, I had a, a, a stellar reputation in this um, community. And it's important to me that the truth comes out. And I'll be honest, I don't care how long it takes. I mean, I do, but I'm going to push until all of this information that, quite honestly, is in, it's out there. For whatever reason, it just continues to be ignored by persons who should pick it up. I don't know why the criminal charges haven't been filed against the prosecutor, Joe Dieters, and, and, and Supreme Court Justice Pat DeWine for actually doing what they alleged that I did. And, and, and unfortunately, Pat DeWine upheld the conviction against me when he was on the First District Court of Appeals. So he upheld this wrongful conviction, and then in 2017, he sends an email to Joe Dieters in direct violation of 2921.42 and says hire my son in the prosecutor's office. I mean, the hypocrisy, you know, Todd, I just want what's right. I just want what's fair. I just want the truth to come out once and for all. And no matter how long that takes, I'm going to keep making sure that I do whatever I have to do to make to ensure that the truth comes out about what has happened to me. With regard to your brother, I mean, just help the viewers understand, you hear that it's such a convoluted sounding charge and you have to explain it in a way that's like, that you can't read that off, it doesn't roll off the tongue. Is your brother, uh, did he get a, was he able to keep his job because of you or what? I don't understand. I, I did nothing to try to, and, and first of all, I wasn't charged with trying to help my brother keep a job. I was charged with having an unlawful interest in a public contract and securing a public contract, which means I had to have done something to get my brother a job. My brother worked for the juvenile court. I'm not sure what year. I believe it was around maybe 2007. My brother was hired by the Hamilton County Juvenile Court years before I was elected judge. I had absolutely nothing to do with that. And the reason that it seems so convoluted, Todd, is because it's not true. And when something's not true, the person who is making the accusation has to keep changing their story. I can't tell you how many different versions that I've heard of what I supposedly did that I've never done 
And clearly, the fact that no one could present not anything, not one shred of evidence in court to show that I had did and what they accuse me of, I think is pretty clear. That's why it's convoluted because it absolutely makes no sense and it doesn't line up with this statute um, right here. Goodness, um, and, and you know the reality also is, which I think is pretty per powerful and persuasive on your side. There were there were what a ten felony charges against you, ten. and it was the one that got through somehow, or the jury said, okay, we'll agree with that. But I mean, nine not nine no and one yes. You, does that? Uh, what do you say to that? How do you make how do you make sense of that, if you will? You can't make sense of it. Uh, first of all, every single thing that I was supposedly accused of doing. Um, was in the direct um, line of my responsibility as a judge. Let's talk about, for instance, the theft charges. I mean, there are people literally in this county because of these horrific media reports that were, were corroborated, I guess, by the prosecutors that are thinking that Judge Hunter took something. I never stole anything a day in my life, and certainly not from the juvenile court. I filed notices of appeal with the Ohio Supreme Court after the prosecutor's office who was supposed to be representing me on those uh, those cases, those civil lawsuits that were brought against me as judge, they insisted on representing me in those cases and then they let every single one of the cases lapse in a default judgment because they failed to answer them. So I was literally prohibited in writing by Sylvia Hidden, who was Joe Dieter's mother-in-law at the time, I was prohibited in writing from having legal independent representation, which by the way, every judge in Hamilton County has received whenever they have been accused of anything. Megan Shanahan, she was charged or she was filed, a civil lawsuit was filed against her in the Ray Tenzing trial. She was represented by McGuire and Schneider. John Williams was sued, the juvenile court, right after I was suspended. He was represented by the law firm McGuire and Schneider out of Columbus. In fact, every judge before me and after me that was sued has been represented by McGuire and Schneider. So why was Judge Tracy Hunter represented by the prosecutor's office who in fact not only had a personal vendetta against me, not only was being vindictive because by the way, I believe you know that I had just filed ethics complaints uh, against him and it was within less than two weeks after I filed an ethics complaint against Joe Dieters for misconduct on those cases and for refusing to allow me to have independent legal representation so that I would be properly represented as a judge, that he then, in his office, made the accusation that I had somehow um, committed crime. It was vindictive, it was malicious, and it was in direct retaliation for my um, filing that ethics complaint against him. He was suing me and representing me at the exact same time. And to your point, the others had not had that same treatment. They had the external Absolutely. Attorneys. And then even after he abruptly um, recused himself from my case after I filed the ethics complaint, he then hired or retained two lawyers that I'd never heard of in life, Farooz Nami and uh, James Bogan. One was a criminal lawyer, one was an immigration attorney. Neither of them had any experience in juvenile court and definitely had never represented an elected official, let alone a judge. Okay, again, a lot to unpack in all this. And just, uh, the idea that, let's talk just about the Facebook post that was made on the day that Judge Black, um, yes. you know, it was interesting because as you, as you, you know, clearly you're, you're adamant in your, in your view that, that you were wrongfully convicted and so Absolutely. forth. And then, then, then it sort of got into this territory about, you know, making sure you take drug tests going into jail and, and protecting yourself. You will not be harmed. It, are you concerned for your safety if you do end up in jail? Talk about that. Todd, I've been concerned for my safety since 2010. I have literally often, because of the, um, the accusations that were made against me starting in, in 2010 and, and the intimidation tactics that were used to get me to drop my, my um, election lawsuit, I've been in fear for my life the en entire time, literally. And when you look at the amount of racial hostility around the country right now, and um, you have a, a lot of persons that have, have been killed, unfortunately, by law enforcement, but then you've had a lot of persons like Sandra Bland to end up uh, in, 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 in prison for something so, a, a street of, you know, whatever it was, and she ends up dead. And because the persons who are in charge of the system are the persons who have uh, intimidated me, who have uh, talked about me, who have falsely accused me, and these are the ones that really want me off the bench, 
and that really um, want me to pay for having the audacity to, to run for Hamilton County Juvenile Court Judge, I, I've absolutely been concerned uh, for my, my physical safety in, in, in jail. And so because I am a, not only a pastor, but I don't drink, I'm never drunk. I don't do anything illicit. I don't go any place illicit and I don't do anything illicit. And so it's very important to me that yes, before I go into um, uh, to the Justice Center, that I will be personally examined to make sure that everything is in order and that you know there's no illicit substances in my body because I don't do anything uh, except you know drink water and juice. And I just want to make sure that when I go in, that no one is able to do anything harmful to me, or if they do, that persons will know that something happened to me because I. I, I, I it's unfortunate that I have to say that. I'm not gonna harm myself because you have a lot of cases or persons saying, like in Sandra Bland, they said she committed suicide. I honestly don't know. I just need to make clear to the public that I have no intention of harming myself, that I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I don't do anything illicit, and I wanna make sure that when I go into, uh, if, if I am incarcerated, that my, my doctor will be able to verify that independently before I ever become uh, placed in the system. Let's circle back quickly and I wrap it up with the idea. You were talking about when you walked in as a judge and you had, there was misconduct off the bat. Were these other court workers, I assume you're referencing, that were just, just didn't like you being in that room? I, I was, I'm not totally aware. When we were talking earlier, the idea when you walked into the courtroom and you were taking your bench every day, that it just, oh. you just weren't greeted the way a judge should be. Is that, am I correctly interpreting oh, that? That yeah. there were just other court, court workers that didn't like you? Well, like, like, well I was told, shouldn't be here. well, I was actually told by Lisa Miller and Lisa Miller became the case manager. Let me just, when I walked into the juvenile court, there was nothing in place that would normally be in place for a, um, for a sitting judge. They didn't have anyone that could properly do my, um, my um, judicial entries. It took several months before they were able to supposedly train someone to do them. And you are you arguing that that was not the case for previous judges? They came in, they had. Well, I would assume the thought being they knew what they they had hit the ground running. You were not able to hit the ground running. In because words. there was no staff that was properly trained to assist me. And even Lisa Miller said on the bench, even the accusations that how does a judge first of all forge her own judicial entries? I was accused of forgery. And of course it turned out later that, you know, Lisa Miller said on the stand, she said, well, Judge Hunter didn't do this. She said, I did this and I was trained by Connie Murdoch to do this. So again, Connie Murdoch and persons like that were all working for John Williams. Kirk Kissinger refused to work for me as a juvenile court judge. And so when I attempted to hire a court administrator as every judge before me had done, they each had their own and, and the court records, I, you know, they brought me records to, um, to verify that the judges before me each had their own court administrator. But when I hired a court administrator because Kirk Kissinger refused to work for me, in fact, not only was he not working for me, he was working against me behind the scenes that I, I discovered. And so just to come in and to try to get my job done, I was denied help. I was denied the use of my own budget to be able to bring in the help that I needed. I was being threatened physically at the court regularly. My staff, my assistant was afraid to, um, to walk to the court by herself. She was afraid because somehow these threats were getting to me uh, through social media as a sitting judge. And so the protections, even for my personal security and that of my staff, uh, we were denied that. Last question I'll ask you, I'm trying after hearing all this, how, what percentage would you say, or how do you, how would you break it down, political versus racial animus? How would, what, what's your thought on that? Quite honestly, Todd, it, at some point, it, I don't want to say it, it, it doesn't matter which one it is, because I honestly can't say it any, I couldn't break down a percentage, percentage of what part is, is racial and what part is political. I just know that it was both racially and politically motivated, everything um, that was happening to me. And it's, and it's really sad because for the first time in history, you had an African-American person who was elected by the people. You know, that's a, the whole, the, that's a whole nother um, um, interview right there. Most of the judges, as you know, are politically appointed. And even John Williams, John Williams lost the election to me. So how do you think I felt when he lost the election, but they wanted so strongly for him to be in juvenile court and to be the judge 
that they were willing to hold me off the bench fighting a lawsuit and allow Governor Kasich to appoint him to the seat, which, by the way, um, was an appointed seat. And according to the Ohio Constitution and, and really, I believe, the revised code, that an appointed judge doesn't even have the full power of the seat that belongs to someone else because they're filling an unexpired term. I came in fully elected by the people. I was the people's choice, yet I was denied the opportunity to do my job the way that the Ohio Revised Code and the Ohio Constitution uh, required that I do uh, my job. And so it wasn't just bad for me, Todd, it was bad for all of the uh, residents of Hamilton County, not only the 120,000 people who elected me into office, but the entire county, because I represented all people. I represent black people, I represent white people, I represent Hispanic people. And my job as a juvenile court judge was to come in to rehabilitate the children, to make sure that the families of Hamilton County, regardless of their socioeconomic background or their racial background, or even their political political background, they were treated fairly. And I was denied that opportunity to serve the people that I was elected to serve. Well, then, we'll stop there unless anything else you're about to judge. Then again, this, this reporting will, you know, unfortunately, given time constraints, there's a lot here that I've got to have to just chew on going forward and, and take a closer look at it. So I, and I will do so. And I say that in all candor, it's, um, but you know, when you when you have time constraints, you can appreciate that, but we'll do the best we can. So we'll stop there and maybe get a shot of us talking for a second, okay. if that's okay. Do you, and, I, and I pardon me for asking this, because I should know this. Okay. Because you've been convicted, have you been disbarred? Are you, has that already happened? I mean, again, I should, this is probably the most naive question. I should have already done my homework and know this, but are you? No, I was suspended. You suspended, I was okay. Sus suspended, and as far as. So your legal license has been suspended, but that's that's the extent of it at this point. It, that's been the extent since uh, January 10th, 2014. And quite okay. honestly, even that was unusual because as a sitting judge, even if someone had a complaint against me, right. The proper way to address that complaint was not to file criminal charges as Joe Dieters initiated and then got Marilyn Shiverdecker and Scott Croswell to do. The proper way to either investigate or even to complain against a sitting judge is to file a grievance with the Ohio Supreme Court. That's what happened with Pat DeWine and with uh, Joe Dieters. But somehow or another, they just they just went straight to the they charge. They skipped that stage altogether and charged me with crime. Has, has has Mr. DeWine has he been has a grievance been filed uh, to was, your point with three? It was filed two years ago, and to date, this is 2019. Huh. This happened in April 2017. The city beat exposed this okay, so in 2000 beat. in August, I believe, 2017. And it's now been over two years, and nothing has happened to um, either Pat DeWine or, or Joe Dieters. Neither of them has been charged with crime, um, and the, it appears that the ethical complaint may have even been dismissed. But that's, is that an obtuse kind of thing, trying to understand where that stands? Well, I'd certainly try to make a run at that, too. That would be great if you can if you can investigate and find out, because legal experts across the, the country at, at law schools have actually weighed in on that particular issue, and yet nothing has happened. So again, why am I the only judge that has not only been targeted and been wrongfully targeted, but the exact statute that it's clear, even in some of the, in fact, I believe whoever was prosecuting the, um, the complaint against uh, Supreme Court Justice Pat DeWine, mm -hmm. he stated that he violated that that statute, and yet he's still been sitting on the bench for the last two years. Nothing has happened to um, to uh, interfere with his service as a, as a judge, and yet I'm still not only being harassed and intimidated, I'm now facing incarceration. It's it's. I was struck by because I'm thinking of some other attorneys that I've known. Even though, and again, I mean, there's some other lay person asking this clearly. If you're a, even if as a, uh, as a lawyer, because that's effectively what you are, is it whether you're a judge or you're still Correct. a lawyer. You must be a lawyer first. You, you can get a, you can be charged with a felony and even convicted. I'm thinking like maybe a DUI or whatnot, and you can still then go back to the bench eventually or go back to practicing law, right? So, I mean, is, is there some thought that on down the road you, you could be practicing law again? Even if you do end up in jail, I don't know. Well, again. And that's me asking as a lay person because I don't know how this stuff works. Honestly, this whole case has been unusual. What has happened to me has never happened before. I've seen them change the rules. I've seen them um, not follow the laws. In fact, I've seen them violate the laws where I am concerned. So I couldn't even begin to tell you 
um, what will happen. I can tell you what should happen, but everything that should have happened so far has not happened. In fact, everything uh, has, uh, again, just went contrary to, to the law and to the rules of ethics. Would you want to practice law again to help kids or to help families? I will always help children and I will always help families. And I have to um, get through uh, this process and then make a determination because honestly, what I've seen and experienced here in Hamilton County, um, I'm just not sure that um, I would want to be in a county that doesn't follow laws and that targets people based on race and based on um, their political affiliation. Well, that, I was struck by reading and reading the Facebook post from, I think, June 1, and it was a rather lengthy one where you said, you know, African Americans just sort of accept the fate of the power structure as is or whatever. That, you know, I, paraphrasing your words and doing it poorly, mm -hmm. but you're saying, I don't make any apologies, I'm not gonna stand for that, never have, never will, and that I find very interesting. You know, you, in fact, you're saying, don't send messages about supporting me in jail, because that's not what I want, so make, stand up and make your voice heard. That's an interesting, you know, I find that very interesting. You because clearly aren't just saying, okay, my fate, I'm resigned to my fate. I watch too many people as a lawyer, and again, that's why I became a judge. I watch too many people, this, you're familiar with Central Park Five, and many people have compared my case to that case uh, because it was a clear, um, uh, egregious violation of my constitutional rights, yet even when the truth comes out that these horrible things have happened that, and, and, and it comes out clear that I'm innocent, they're still uh, bent on incarcerating me uh, for something that I never did because no crime was ever committed. And so um, when I look at um, the fact that African Americans, and I had cases like this. In fact, Todd, one of the very last cases that I heard at the juvenile court in 2020, because that was right after the flood, uh, took place at the juvenile court. Oh, yes. um, the, one of the very last cases I had, it involved a young man who everybody, I believe both the prosecutors and the defense attorneys, all knew was innocent. And it was kind of like actually this case in where one of the kids had actually reported something that he saw wrong. And in this case, he reported it, but he ended up becoming accused, the accused, as opposed to the persons that he actually witnessed. And because it was a case where he could be bound over as an adult, the kid was so afraid that he would be bound over as an adult that he was willing to plead to something that everybody knew that he had not done. And this happens to African Americans a lot. Um, I was facing, according to the reports, being charged wrongfully with nine, ten felonies. You remember the reports. They were saying I was facing 13 to 20 years in prison for something that everybody knew that I hadn't done. But many African Americans, when they're put in a situation like that and they fear for their lives, they fear for their freedom. They believe the system is They, they know rigged. that this, this system is stacked against them. Oftentimes, they will plead to something just to get it over with when given a, you know, the alternative. What's the alternative? Yeah, I'm fully aware of that. I think, and that's a story I, I really would like to mine. It's hard to get data and to get records that support, but I know it, it's, it's more than anecdotal. And it, it's the reality yes. for, you know, and Stations in Life Matter and so forth. But I mean, at the very least, if you shine a light on something, at least there's a conversation about cash bail that seems to be growing. Right. That's that a plus. Is, that and there's true. a lot of social justice warriors around here that want to want to keep pounding that message and that's you know for us in the media we got to keep having it pounded into our heads sometimes because we we don't know everything all at once you know and it's hard to and when you're, this is law yeah and, and i think it, that listen you do an right. amazing job of breaking down the law i mean i, I you know so. i've never like i said we've never met and i'm completely taken by your command of these issues and so forth i mean I, clearly somebody on the other side would look at this and say well she's you know she doesn't know what she's talking about or whatever and you know how that is there you know you've been listening you've been living it for a while but i find it fascinating you sharp as a tack, and I'm like, it's, you know, I hear you you're going off to jail, it sounds like. And, like that, and, and, and to Damon, Reverend Lynch's point is, that, does that make any sense? I don't, I, don't, I don't make judgments. I try not to anyway. But it's lovely to meet you. <clears throat> and, I, and I'm sorry you're, you know, I'd say to anybody, but certainly trials and tribulations you've been dealing with seem like they're pretty pretty uh, severe, you know? So we'll, we'll try to make sense of it for the evening news tonight. And then I'm going to sit on a lot of this stuff and have conversations with my crew and think how, you know, is there more to do with this? I mean, how do we, how do we push forward on some of these issues? So. That would be great.
It's a lot. We, Are we good time? Think about it. Yeah, thank we're you. Good. Yeah, I think we're fine. If that suits you, uh, Judge Hunter, you, yeah, appreciate it, everybody.